All right, well, Ephesians chapter 5, um, we are, Ephesians chapter 5 is where we are tonight, as we are um, going to wrap up this chapter, uh, actually, we're going to wrap this chapter up tonight, so um, we've been looking at this household code of the um, husband and wives, um, as Paul's going into the sections we discussed, and there's three areas in which Paul is discussing in this household codes that he he's kind of uh, dealing with, and that is the husband and wives, the the parent children, and then uh, master slave, which uh, we'll look at the parent and children next next week. Um, so we've been looking at the the husband and wife relationship that that Paul has been speaking of here, and uh, we we discussed verses 25 through 27 last week, and I'm actually going to read through verses 25 and. We're going to cover 28 through 33 tonight, and Paul is still speaking here um, within this uh, relationship as we discussed uh, the wives, uh, I guess, two weeks ago, looking at the role the wives play in this relationship. So let's pick up at verse 25 and just reread what we, what we studied last week, and because it all flows together here as Paul has turned to the husbands in verse 25 uh, to address their role and what God desires for them. So listen to what it says here. It says, husbands, love your wives. As Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, uh, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. And here's where we'll pick up tonight. Uh, In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself, for no one ever hated his own flesh but nourishes and cherishes it, uh, just as Christ does the church, because we are members of his body. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is profound, and I am saying it, that it refers to Christ and the church. However, let each one of you love his wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. Um, so, as I was saying, we have been looking at this household code over the past um, two weeks. Uh, and we have been discussing, as we talked about, the Paul addressed, first of all, he addressed the wives and, and telling them that they are to submit themselves to their own husbands. And we talked about how that this submission in which Paul was talking about was, it wasn't a command, it was that written in a way that she is to voluntarily submit to her husband and then Paul uh, begins to show uh, bringing in this correlation with Christ and the church and saying that she is to submit to her husband as Christ has submitted to the church or as the church has submitted to Christ rather. Um, and so she in the same manner is to do so. Um, and then Paul, as we talked about last week, he went to the role of saying, OK, so here's what the wives are to do. And now he is saying this is what the husbands are to do. And he's telling the husbands that you are to love your wives. And it is, uh, it is interesting that Paul wrote verse 25 as a command. The, the word that Paul uses there, the verb that Paul uses there for love, is written as an imperative. It is a command for the husbands to love their wives. And, and this is to, to show the characteristic of the husband towards his wife. It's a characteristic of of. Uh, that he loves her, a characteristic of his nature or his nurture and his cherisher, cherishing her, um, to protect her, to provide for her. Um, this is a characteristic. Uh, if you remember uh, several weeks ago, we talked about how these things should not be named among you and how this not should not be a characteristic of your life as these sins. So you could almost flip this in a, in a positive sense here. That this should be the characteristic of, your, of a husband towards his wife, that he is one who loves her. Um, and, it, and it's also noticed that, that this is not contingent on the wife. It's not contingent on her appearance. It's not contingent on her behavior. Uh, he is to love her unconditionally. He is to love her regardlessly, regardless. He is to love her. Um, and then Paul once again gives the example of his love for, uh, the love for the, the wife as being set within Christ's love for the church. Um, As he says in verse 25, husband, love your your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. 
Uh, Christ laid down his life for the church to display his love for her. And that is the extent to which the, the husband is to love his wife. Um, as John wrote in 1 John 3.16, by this we know love that he laid down his life for us. Um, that is the expression of God's love. And it's not saying that Paul is calling the husbands to, to lay down their lives for their wives, but Paul is saying in this extent, your love should be expressed that you will be willing to sacrifice your life, sacrifice everything, your, your um, fame, your status, whatever for your wife because she uh, is the one you are to love. And then Paul, uh, and this is all review, then Paul digress for, for two verses to talk about Christ. And the church, and he gives two purpose clauses in verses 26 and 27. And the first is the purpose for which Christ gave himself up for the church. And he says this in verse 26, that he might sanctify her. So Christ has, has died or given himself up for the church that he might sanctify the church. And there's two kind of basic understandings of the word sanctify there. One is, is that it refers to possession, uh, that he... Only that he that she is his. If you remember that we looked in Ezekiel chapter sixteen, which gives a great picture, of course, correlating. And some believe that Paul even was referring to Ezekiel sixteen. But in Ezekiel sixteen verse, I think it's verse eight. Uh, Ezekiel writes that I made a covenant with you, and you became mine. Uh, is this possession that that it is set apart? The the church is set apart, consecrated. Uh, for Christ, for God, as being a possession of his, as his. Um, but it also conveys that of purity, purification from sin. And we also see that in Ezekiel, where it says, Ezekiel said, I will wash you. Uh, in Ezekiel 16, I think it even goes into verse 9, uh, that I will wash you, I will cleanse you. Even in Ezekiel 36, it says that I will wash you with water and cleanse you with the sprinkling of water. Um and the means by which he cleanses the church is in verse 26 also where he says, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word. It is the word of God that Paul, that, that Paul is saying that God uses to cleanse the church, to wash the church of the impurities uh, of sin. And that's, as we talked about last week, that is the importance of us preaching and teaching the gospel to the church. That the church will, the only way the church is going to be removed from sin is through the preaching of the gospel. Because that's the, what God has set in place for the church to be cleansed. But the second purpose clause that, that Paul wrote also in, in verse 27, uh, the purpose for which Christ sanctifies the church, he sanctified the church in verse 27 so that he might present the church to himself in splendor. Christ died to sanctify the church so that he might present the church. That word splendor means in all her glory. Uh, matter of fact, uh, the root of the word that Paul uses there for splendor actually is the word in the Greek for glory. Um, and so he is going to present her in all her glory without stain, without wrinkle. Uh, Christ died for the church uh, to make the church beautiful and radiant and perfect to be able to be presented to and let me just bring this up because I think it's just a wonderful truth and a wonderful fact that we, we discussed last week is that the church is beautiful. The church is radiant. The church is able to be presented to Christ, not in her own beauty, but only because of what Christ did for her. Christ has made her beautiful let me I, I won't plan on doing this but just just turn with me because i think it's important just for us to understand this concept back to ezekiel chapter 16 and and listen listen to this um i'm not gonna read the whole thing but but if you if you read in the first part of ezekiel 16 it talks about how he found uh this is speaking of israel found her in her in wallowing in her blood no one cared for her she was left for dead uh christ or God came, she was naked, he gave her clothing, he gave her uh, jewelry, he, he, he decorated her, he made her beautiful. Um, just pick up at verse 13 of Ezekiel 16, it says, And thus you were adorned with gold and silver, and your clothing was fine linen, your silk was embroidered cloth, 
Uh, you ate fine flour and honey and oil. You grew exceedingly beautiful and advanced to royalty. Uh, your renown went forth among the nations because of your beauty. And it, for it was perfect. And listen to this. And this is the important verse right here. For it was perfect through the splendor that I bestowed on you. It was the work of God. It was the work of Christ that makes the church in her splendor, in her beauty. That he, displayed, uh, he bestowed it on her. And I love how it says here, for it was perfect. And, and, and we, we said this last week that, that the church has to be perfect because we serve a perfect and righteous and holy God. And so anything less than perfect is not worthy uh, to be presented to the bridegroom. And this verse 26 and 27 is, is one thing that we must understand. It's purely Christological. It, it, it is not referring to what the husband can do for the wife. Uh, when Paul digresses the verses 26 and 27, he is solely speaking of Christ. He is solely getting away from necessarily the husband and wife relationship to just focus on what Christ did for the church. And the, now the point that Paul is making in verses 26 to, to kind of digress into that is the, the role that he's just saying, this is the manner in which you are to love your wife. In other words, that as Christ gave himself up for the church, you in the same manner are to give yourself up for, uh, for your bride. So now that we've come to verse 28, uh, in verse 28, Paul really kind of continues back to or kind of goes back into his original uh, mentioning in verse 25 uh, of the husbands loving their wives. Uh, so he's returning to this exhortation of the husbands loving their wife. And, and Paul gives us a, a metaphor on how the husbands are to love their wives. And he kind of changes here his, uh, his, his kind of discussion here uh, in, in some way. And he looks at the man's care for his own body is how he describes this. Listen to what he says in verse 28. It says, in the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. Now, in the same way is referring back to verse 25. Um, it's the basic idea that Paul's making here is, is as Christ loved the church in this same manner, husbands should love their wives. Um, Christ loved the church in a way that he gave himself up for her, that he died for the church. And this is the manner that, that husbands are to love their wives in this manner. Now, Paul stretch, stresses the duties of the love uh, of the husband's love for his wife by the verb that he uses there. Uh, if you're reading in the ESV, which is what I'm reading, it's, it should, um, or it can be translated ought to love his wife. As he says here that, um, in the same manner, the husband should or should or ought to love their wife. And, and the verb implies this moral obligation for him to love his wife. Um, this is not just an obligation to his wife, but it's also an obligation to Christ. Uh, if you remember what I just said earlier, verse 25 was written as an imperative. It's written as a command. You're commanded to love your wife. And so as it, since it's an imperative, this is an obligation to Christ as well as to your wife. It's a moral obligation to love her. Um, now, Paul adds this, this new thought here to give practical understanding of how the men should love their wives. And he says here, they should love their wives as their own bodies. And he's given this practical understanding for us to kind of grasp and understand how we are to love our wives. And in a general sense, what Paul is saying here is, is that no man is going to hurt his body. No man is going to seek to hurt himself. He's going to protect himself. He's going to protect his body from danger and take care of his body to be in the best shape that he can be in. And the wives or the husbands are to, are, are to be viewed uh, as if she is his own body. He is to love it in that sense in which he is to care for her, care for her needs. He is to facilitate it for, for her growth and for development. And Paul goes on to say here in verse 28, he who loves his wife loves himself. And really this is alluding to, to uh, Leviticus uh, 19 and 18 where it says, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. 
uh, you to view your neighbor as yourself and you to love them in the same manner. Paul is saying here, and he's applying it to husbands and wives, that you as a husband are to look at your wife and love her as you would love yourself. And he who loves his wife loves himself. And, I, and I'll, I'll, I'll show you why this is in, in just a minute. Um, Paul will give us that answer uh, as to how this is, is so. Um, but he goes on to say here in verse 29, he says, For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it. Mm-hmm. And so this is the general reality that Paul is putting here. Paul is putting just a, a general application here of, of, of a man protecting his body, not doing harm to himself uh, in a general sense that nobody's going to do that. And Paul is saying that no one hates themselves to hurt themselves. And that is how you are to view your spouse. That is how you are to view your wife, is that you love her in the same manner in which you would love your own self, you would love your own body to protect you. So he says these people are to to nourish, these people seek to nourish their body. Um, they give their bodies the things that they need to grow and to to come to 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 be healthy and to to grow in a certain area, they, they cherish their bodies and that they protect them from the things that could call damage to the body or things that would call harm to the body in protecting it. That is exactly how Paul is saying we are to love our wives. We are to, to nourish them. We are to give them the things that they need spiritually and physically and emotionally for them to grow in those areas within the relationship of the marriage. Um, how many times or how often do you do you see women who are just uh they're, they're beautiful and they're, they're strong women um and and they they get married and their husband is not one who is who is nourishing them within the, the marriage relationship he's not giving them especially uh, especially spiritually speaking that he's not nourishing them or or giving them the things and then you, you look at that that person years later and and they look beat down they look uh, I guess, undernourished in a spiritual sense of the word, so to speak, because the husband is not loving them and, and nourishing them within that confine of the marriage relationship. The marriage relationship is to be a place where both can grow uh, spiritually, um, along with emotionally and physically. Um, the husband is also to cherish his wife, and this means to, to foster with a tender care or to cherish with a tender love. Um, it is oftentimes it is used within the Greek, but also even within Scripture of talking about a mother taking care of her children. In First Thessalonians two seven, it says, "But we uh, were gentle among you, like a nursing mother taking care of her own children." Is where it's used again in Scripture. It is protecting your wife. It is giving the tender love and care, and, and this is more than just protecting her from physical danger. This is protecting her from the attacks of Satan. It is protecting her from the spiritual warfare. It's not allowing the enemy to enter into your home or enter into the relationship in any way. Um, It it is shielding her and the marriage relationship with the Word of God. Um, she, She is a gift that is given to you. And you're to protect that gift that God has given to you in honoring her, and by doing so, you're honoring God as him being the one who has given you the gift that he has given to you. And, and Paul gives this correlation again, and he, he intermingles this once again of the husband roles to that of Christ toward the church. As he says at the end of verse 29, just as Christ does the church. So just as Christ nourishes and cherishes the church, so are we in like manner to nourish and cherish our wives. Christ has done this by giving himself up for the church. He laid down his life for her that she may be nourished, that he may that the church is given the Holy Spirit that gives them everything that the church needs to grow uh, into what God desires. Uh, if you remember in Ephesians chapter 4, where 
he, the, he, he says that he has equipped them with the, the saints to, for the building up of the body. In verse 13, until we all obtain the, the unity of the faith, knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, um, to, to grow in this maturity. Uh, the church is nourished and protected by, um, by God giving us the Holy Spirit through Christ laying down his life for us. So the church would know the love of God. Um, and, and no matter... Uh, what happens in our life to know that the church is protected from the wrath of God and from the attacks of the gates of hell that come against us? Uh, doesn't mean that it doesn't mean that we would not suffer in this life. It does not mean that we would not face things in this life. But we are protected from what is to come. We are protected from the wrath of God. We are protected from the attacks of Satan, from a spiritual sense of, of relinquishing our souls to. To his temptations, um, and this is what the image that that he's given there of of the church uh, with Christ um, is that he is willing to lay down his life for the church. Um, now, as as I said, a man laying down his life for his his wife is not going to uh, give her the the Holy Spirit. But it does show uh, the type and the extent of the love to which we are to love them as displayed by Christ and his love for the church. And listen to, to, to how he continues with this um, analogy of Christ's relationship to the church. Listen to what he says in verse 30. He says, because we are members of his body. Paul takes the analogy of the husband's love for his wife to that of Christ and the church to a deeper level here. Um, a man should love his wife as his own body because Christ has loved the church as his own body because we are members of the body. And this is how Paul is correlating this general idea of a man protecting his own body and should love his wife uh, as he does his own body because he would take care of it because Christ is love for the church. The church is the body of Christ. And Paul has stated this earlier in, in, in Ephesians 1, 22 and 23. He says, but he put all things under his feet and gave him as head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who feels all things or feels all in all. In Ephesians 3 and 6, it says, And this mystery is that the Gentiles are fellow heirs, members of the same body. In 1 Corinthians, Paul writes this to the Corinthian church. In 1 Corinthians uh, 12 and 12, And just as the body is one and has many members, and all members of the body, uh, though many are, but are one body, uh, so it is with Christ. For in, one, for in one spirit, we are all baptized into one body. He goes on to say in verse 27 of 1 Corinthians 12 and 27, he says, and you are the body of Christ and individual members of it. And so he is saying here that we are members of the body of Christ, that Christ loves his body, so he nourishes it, he cherishes the body, and Christ loves us as he loves himself uh, as us being the body. And, and notice this, that Paul here in this passage connects the two major themes of the church or major images of the church of being the bride and the body. He correlates them and connects them both together in this passage. That the bride is the body of Christ and that Christ laid down his life for the bride. He laid down his life. He, he loves the bride as he loves his body because he cares for himself. He loves himself. And so we, since we are the body of Christ, we receive the love of God uh, through that manner. The reason that Christ takes care of the church is because every person is individually a member of the corporate body. And he's saying as Christ, as a husband loves his wife as himself, as his own body, he's saying this is correlating with Christ loving himself and loving the body 
because the body is members of, of Christ. And so why is man to love his wife as his own body? And here's the reason that we are to, to love our wives in this manner. Listen to what he says in verse 31. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. He should love her as himself because she has become an integral part of himself. Paul is quoting here Genesis 2.24, which is God establishing the covenant relationship of marriage. When a man and a woman enter into this covenant relationship of marriage, they are no longer two, but the Bible says they become one flesh. And every aspect of that being, emotionally, physically, spiritually, is encompassed here in this. That they're no longer viewed as being separate. They are viewed in an intimate union together as being considered in such a union together that they're no longer seen as two individual fleshes, but they're seen as one flesh united together. The word there, hold fast, or to be bound together, is actually the Greek word that is used for glue. It is, it is gluing two things together is actually what that word means. And, and think about this. When two things are glued together, they're still distinct from each other. They don't lose their personalities as, as two individuals. So if, if this, for example, if I glued my two hands together, uh, you remember in school we used to take Elmer's glue and, and glue your hands together anyway. Uh, so if you, you can still see there's two distinctions of there's my right hand and my left hand, but they're together in union with one another. They're, they're seen, if you look at it this way, it's seen as being one instead of two distinct things, but they're seen as being one. But, you know, as I was thinking about this, you know, if you glue two things together and you attempt to tear them apart, though you may succeed in tearing them apart, what you have done is you have damaged the two things that they don't keep their same character as they were before they were bound together. And if you think about it, in the, in the, in the culture today of, of, of marriage, two people are bound together in a covenant union of marriage and divorce comes in and it, it tears them apart. And, and no matter what the case is, they are never the same. There's always that residual effect of what is taking place. There's always that effect of being defected in some way from the original state because you were bound together with someone in a union. And I think that's our culture today does not understand really what marriage is in the biblical context of this covenant union with a person that you are not two distinct people. Now you become one flesh. And it's a covenant. It is not uh, just let's try this thing out and, and hope it works. Let's just, uh, if it doesn't work out, hey, if we don't like each other in a year, we can, we can get a divorce. No, that is not marriage. Marriage is binding two things together, two people together, a husband and a wife, a man and a woman, binding them together. I heard the other day, and I, and I thought this was good. It was a, a man talking about a, a statement that a, a preacher was, was marrying uh, this, this uh, a man and, and woman, and he was he was speaking to the bride and groom, and he, he told them, he says, you're entering into a covenant with one another. And he says that when, when things are going good, love is what's going to keep you together. He says, but when things are going bad, he said, it's this covenant union that you're making now that is to keep you together. <clears throat> because this is what's going to bind you together is this covenant union. And we are bound to one another in this covenant of marriage. Now, Paul here in this passage in Ephesians points to the fact um, of the verse of, of Genesis 2.24. He, he is pointing to the union of a man and a woman, but really he kind of transcends the institution of marriage 
to the point of the closeness and the unity between Christ and the church. The word therefore at the beginning of verse 31 refers directly back to the previous statement of verse 30. Verse 30 says, because we are members of his body, therefore. So he's relating what he's about to say in this this verse, in verse 31, to what he had just mentioned in verse 30. Not only has a man and a woman become one flesh in the covenant union of marriage, but it's also referring to the union and covenant of Christ and his people that they have become one. Paul is stating here, and and so many times he has in in the first chapter, if you remember the first two chapters, especially in the verses, uh, chapter 1, verses 3 through 14, that Paul uses that constant phrase, in Christ, in Christ, that we are joined together with him, that we are in union with Christ, that we are bound together with Christ, we are in him. He, He gives us all these blessings that we are in him. When we are in him, we receive these blessings. We are predestined because we are in him. We are adopted because we are in him. We receive an inheritance because we are in him. We give him the Holy Spirit because we are in him. We are joined, as it goes on in chapter 2, to talk about the union of the church and the body, that we are in this covenant because we are in Christ. It's this union. It's this relationship. And according to Paul, Paul says this is a mystery in verse 32. This mystery is profound, and I am saying that it refers to Christ and to the church. Now, there's some debate over what Paul is meaning here in verse 32, and two of the debates is that that's uh, kind of debated among scholarship is first of all, what does Paul mean by the word mystery? And then what is Paul saying here when he says it refers to Christ and the church? And, and we have to understand the word mystery as the way Paul has used the word mystery throughout the book of Ephesians. Remember, Paul talked about it in, in, in Ephesians chapter 3, talking about the mystery of Christ. And he uses it a few other times, I believe. But the way Paul uses the word mystery in this chapter or in this letter is that mystery is a hidden purpose of God that is now revealed in Christ. In other words, it was something that God had hidden and now it has been revealed only through Christ Jesus. Remember, that's what Paul said in Ephesians chapter 3 when he was talking about the mystery, this mystery that is in the Gentiles or fellow heirs, members of the same body and partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. So it is something that has been hidden to it from us, but now has been completely revealed to us only through the work of Christ and only in Christ. So if this is the meaning of the word that Paul is intending to use it for, then there's something more profound about the Genesis text than providing simply an illustration or an allegory or an, uh, uh, an allegory of the union of Christ and the church. There's, this, there's a, a new reality that is taking place. If this is the case, then the institution of marriage in Genesis was given to us as an illustration of the union between Christ and the church. The Genesis chapter 2, speaking about the union and the covenant of marriage between a man and a woman would be an illustration of that is now being revealed to us in Scripture as being really the union that Christ had for the church. Frank Thillman stated this. This is the union of husband and wife in one flesh was originally intended to prefigure and to illustrate the union that Christ now has with the church. This is something that could have been, uh, this is something that could become clear only after Christ had died to create the church in its new multi-ethical form. And this is why it is a mystery. A truth that could be known only through God's gracious revelation of it. It is a great mystery because it is unusually mysterious. And if this is the case, then we see that God already have the church in mind as being the bride of Christ as early as Genesis chapter 2. 
and in reality, according to Ephesians, in reality, before the foundations of the world. Matter of fact, George Knight stated this. He says, Paul saw that when God designed the, the, or, the, the original marriage, he already had church and the Christ, the, 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 he already had Christ and the church in mind. This is one of God's great purposes in marriage to picture the relationship between Christ and his redeemed bride forever. The mystery that is so profound that Paul is, is interpreting from Genesis is that Christ and his bride, being the church, has come into a close union with one another that they have become as one flesh. They have become as one. If you remember what Jesus prayed for in, Jesus, uh, in John chapter 17, verse 20, he says, I do not ask for these only, meaning the disciples that are currently with him, but also for those who will believe in me through their words. So those who are to come through salvation, us and those who are before us and after us. Verse 21, that they will all be one, just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be one in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. The glory that you have given me, I've given to them, that they may be one, even as we are one. I in them and you in me, that they may become perfectly one so that the world may know that you sent me and love them even as you love me. You see that covenant relationship there. You see that covenant union there of Christ and the church. That, that, that Christ came to die for the church. Christ came to make this covenant relationship with the church. And in that covenant relationship of the church, the two bodies became one. Christ brought us into him to be one with him and the Father. This is the covenant relationship of Christ with his people and whom he has redeemed and joined himself to. And the point for us as husbands is this. We and our wives are one flesh joined in the covenant union of marriage, and we're to love her as our own bodies because she is a part of us. And Christ is the example of that type of love through the union of the covenant relationship between Christ and his bride. And so really we see that the marriage relationship is a picture of Christ and the church. And really that is what the world should see in the marriage relationship. The church to see within a marriage this picture of Christ and his bride. It shall exemplify. P.T. O'Brien stated that the interplay of human marriage and the divine marriage between Christ and his people, this mystery is the union of Christ and the church, which is reflected in a truly Christian marriage. A Christian marriage reproduces in miniature, uh, in miniature the beauty shared between the bridegroom and the bride. And so, so, so really, in reality, we were talking about just a little while ago before we started about this, this, this meta-narrative, the, the, the bigger picture of things. The destruction of marriage and the relationship of marriage in our society in the greater picture is destroying the picture in which Christ has set for the world to be able to see the love of Christ, the bride, or the bridegroom for the church being his bride. And they're complete, our culture and our society is completely trying to destroy that image and that picture which God has set, whether they're trying to destroy it by, by saying that now it's not set within the, the confines of what God has set it in, being between only a man and a woman, or whether they're saying that uh, making divorce so prevalent and so easy uh, uh, with all these things that they're, they're putting into effect, 
However, they're trying to destroy the marriage relationship. In essence, it is the work of the devil trying to destroy the overall picture of uh, what God has put in place. Just as after the covenant relationship was formed um, in, the, uh, in the garden, in chapter 2, verse 3 comes, and what does Satan do? He attempts to destroy what God has already put in place. And so that's why it is we, we see the, the culture of marriage in our, our marriage in our culture today is, is so distorted um, from what is intended purpose. This is really the extent in which, which Paul was writing this as being the mystery, then really the marriage covenant relationship of, of Genesis 2 was a grander picture in which God was portraying to us the saying, this is what's going to come, Christ and his bride. And Paul then concludes this household code of the husband and wife's relationship by summarizing what he has stated in the section of verse 33, where he says, however, let each one of you love his wife as himself and let the wife see that she respects her husband. Husbands are to love their wives and wives are to respect or submit to their husbands. And this is the role that God has given to the, to the husband and to the wife within the marriage relationship. Um, and, and we have to understand and we, we have to trust. And I think this is really where the big downfall comes with this Oftentimes when we see these feminist movements and trying to destroy the role of the husband and, and try to put the dominance of the, the woman over the husband in the marriage relationship is that we don't trust God. We don't trust him. We, we have to understand that God put this in place for a purpose. And if God is truly a just God and a, and a righteous God and a, and a loving God as we read throughout Scripture and we, we know that He is through what the Bible is telling us, then if that's the case, then we should trust that even in the confines of the role of marriage, whether we understand it or want to understand it or not, that is how God designed it. And the only way that it will work properly to glorify God, to, to show that picture of Christ and his church, the love that he has for her, is only if it operates within the confines of what God has prescribed for us within Scripture. It's the only way. And for us to go and deviate from that in any way is to say, in essence, whether we speak it or not, is saying we do not trust you, God, and what you have ordained, and we know better than you. The world saying that a man can marry a man or a woman can marry a woman is saying, in essence, we do not care, God, what you have prescribed in the 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 definition of what a marriage relationship is and we know better than you and that's what it boils down to but what is what is so amazing though about this passage of scripture is that how Paul saw fit to to integrate I guess you could use the word to say within this relationship of a man and a woman, a husband and wife, there's this great picture. The, the, the meta narrative of Christ and his bride. That's what it's all about. That's what it's all about. If we, if we look on the grand scheme of things, that it is about a, a gift given to the son from the father in which the son dies for the gift of the bride so she can be beautiful, that she can be made holy, that she can be presented in splendor, and the Holy Spirit sanctifies her, that she can be presented in this way, and that she will be worthy to be able to be presented to Christ as being the bride. 
And then as we, we talked about so many times in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, eventually when it's all said and done, after the bride has been completely sanctified and purified and gathered together, Christ offers the bride back to the Father as a love gift for what he has given to him. And, and really, friends, everything that we see, the small pieces, is really about the love relationship between a father and a son, and that's God the Father and God the Son. And we're really just byproducts in a glorious way uh, of this love relationship between God within the confines of the Trinity. And we may think that's bad, <laughs> that we're not the center of attention, but friends, that's the greatest thing that could ever happen to us is that we're not the center of attention. God has to be. He has to receive the glory. Once again, that's the way God designed it and it has to work that way <laughs> in order for it to be worked properly. And, and let me say that it will work that way because when it's all said and done, God will receive the glory and the praise. And we, in the smaller sense, in the smaller picture of this, we display that great meta narrative, that great picture by our relationship we have with our spouse. Whether it's the woman submitting to her husband as unto the Lord, or whether it's us as men loving our wives as Christ loved the church, by having those two roles playing out the way that God has intended for them in Scripture shows this, this kind of miniature picture of the beauty of the relationship between Christ and the church. And it should give the world a greater understanding of what Christ did for his bride. So, as we are wrapping this section up, husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church, that he gave himself up for her. And wives, submit to your husband as unto the Lord. And realize that both of us, husbands and wives, are part of the bride or the body of Christ in which he died to make beautiful and holy and righteous to be presented to him. What an amazing, amazing passage of scripture. Let, it, let us pray. Father, we, we thank you, God, so much that you have bound us together in union with you through the covenant uh, that you have made. Um, God, that we, we are members of your body. We are presented as the bride of Christ. And God, what a great picture this passage displays of the love that you have for your people, the love that you have for the church, the love that you have for your bride. And God, it is so wonderful to know that, God, you have brought us into this union God, it's nothing that we have done. It's nothing that we can do. God, you have made us beautiful. You have made us worthy to be presented to you. You have made us holy and righteous and blameless, God. You have adorned us and all the glory that we will ever have, God, is coming from you and your glory, God, that you have displayed and portrayed on us, God. And God, just a, a beautiful picture of your love for the church. And God, we as, as men, as husbands, should love our wives in the same manner that, God, you gave yourself up for your bride. And God, we should be willing to love our wives to that extent that we're willing to lay down our lives for them. And God, we know that within the confines of marriage, Lord, when a marriage relationship is a husband loving his wife and his wife submitting to the husband, that, Lord, it is a picture of... Uh, on a, on a smaller scale of your love for your bride and the bride submitting to you. So God, help us. God, we can never love our wives the way you intended without the working of the Holy Spirit leading us and directing us to the power uh, uh, through your word and through understanding your scripture, God. And a wife can never submit truly to her husband without the Holy Spirit leading her and the, Holy, the word just guiding her, Lord. So God, just... Help us to build up our marriage relationships, God. Help us to, to, to take 
uh, not take for granted that covenant relationship, that union that we have been entered into when we took those vows, however, whenever we did, God, that we realize at that point, Lord, that we were two individuals, but God, we became one flesh, just as Christ and the bride became one, as you so desired to do so, as you said in John 17. And so, Father, we thank you. Thank you, God, for bringing us into this union. Thank you, God, for giving us the gifts of our, of our spouses. And God, help us to love and nourish and cherish them that would honor you. Yes. And we thank you. In Jesus' name.